السلام عليكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من شر الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ثم الصلاة والسلام على سيدنا وعلى حبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ومن اتبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين We seek refuge in God Almighty from Satan the accursed and we begin in his name the most merciful, the especially merciful, and we ask and beseech him to send his blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family, his companions, and those who follow them with excellence until the end of time. Amen. This session is titled The Untold Story of Al-Quds, and the reason why it is an untold story is because the purpose of AMP is to give us particular narrative, the narrative of the Palestinian cause, and even the historical narrative of Palestine. And it is through this narrative that we actually get meaning and we get spirituality and even inspiration to continue to do the work that we do for human rights and for the Palestinian cause. But what we also have to understand is that this gives us a very particular understanding of what Al-Quds is. We have to remember the prophetic legacy that it holds. We have to remember the spirituality that is in this place from all the dhikr, all of the Quran, all of the salawat that was done in this masjid and at, on top of this mountain, and may Allah bless us with visiting it in one time in our life at least, insha'Allah. And insha'Allah with this, through the activists and the poets and the art and the literature that came out of this cultural hub, gives us that particular narrative that we're trying to present to the world, insha'Allah. And we have a lineup of speakers that will begin to give you a different narrative from a variety of angles about Al-Quds, insha'Allah. Our first speaker is Imam Zaid Shakir, who literally needs no introduction in this audience or in this country. Someone who's pioneered almost everything in the Muslim community in the United States, even co-founding Zaytuna College. And he has a blog that you can check out all the time where he's traveling and where he is at New Islamic Directions. And I know he has very little time before he has to go to Mosque Foundation to give a khutbah. So I will not you know, hold him any further. Imam Zaid Shakir, faliyatafaddan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salam ala Sayyidil Mursaleen Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira Rabbana laka alhamdu kama yanbaghi li jalali wajhik wa li azimi sultanik Subhanaka ala anhsi thanaan alika ant kama athnayta ala nafsik Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira Alhamdulillah uh, Alhamdulillah, we're here at this very critical and important gathering at a very critical time. It's very important for us as Muslims to constantly remind ourselves of the significance of Al-Quds and Masjid Al-Aqsa in our religious teachings in order that we keep these places alive in our consciousness, our social, political, cultural, and religious consciousness. Uh, there are systematic efforts to remove them from our consciousness. We know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran, subhanallahi asra bi abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa alladhi barakna hawla linuriyahum min ayatina innahu huwa al-sami al-basir. That glorified is the one who has taken his servant on a journey by night from the sacred mosque to the furthest mosque whose precincts he has blessed in order to show him some of his signs, the signs of his power, Azawajal. Verily, he is the all-seeing, all-hearing, all-hearing, he all all-seeing. So our Prophet wasallam was taken from Masjid Al-Aqsa to Al-Quds and then into the heavens. And this has always been a sacred site for Muslims. Uh, the Prophet himself وسلم, mentions in the Quran, 
إلى ثلاثة إلى ثلاثة مساجد المسجد الحرام ومسجد هذا والمسجد الأقصى. Don't undertake a visit for specific religious purposes, or it's only uh, uh, sanctioned for you to undertake a specific religious journey to three masjids. The sacred masjid in Mecca, this masjid of mine, the masjid in Nabawi, in al Madina, and masjid al-Aqsa in Jerusalem, al-Quds. So again, we could elaborate on this, but I'm sure others will do that. The point here is that references to Jerusalem in the Quran and the hadith of our Prophet وسلم, have always been a part of our religious consciousness as Muslims. Now there are efforts today to totally remove any legitimacy for these sacred places in Islam. And you can read about them, just go on, on, online and Google uh, arguments against uh, Muslim rights to Quds or to Jerusalem or something like that. And you get many articles where this issue is discussed. So for example, the people were trying to divorce any claim of Muslims to, these sacred, to this sacred place will say, for example, that the Muslims only pray towards Jerusalem and Medina to win over Jewish converts. And when the effort failed, then they changed the Qibla to Mecca. So it was just an acknowledgement of a failed temporal policy. It had no deeper religious significance. By way of example, Another argument they'll say is that Muslim texts don't refer uh, to Jerusalem per se. So they refer to Masjid al-Aqsa and that this is a fictitious place. It's not re referring to any real place. And it was only later that Muslims interpreted Masjid al-Aqsa to be, mean the sacred sites in Jerusalem. So these are the kind of arguments that are being advanced. The Muslims should be very much aware of these. We should also be aware of the involvement of Muslims. During the time of the Prophet وسلم, during the Isra and Mi'raj, during the time of the Khulafa Rashidin, such as Umar and sub subsequent uh, Khulafa Khalifs involvement and visits to Jerusalem. Uh, we should be aware of the engagement of the Umayyads, which included the building of the Qubbat al-Sakhra. We should be aware of the engagement of the Abbasids and others, and the building also during the Umayyad time of Masjid al-Aqsa, of the Abbasids, the Mamluks, who built many of the walls and built the present Masjid al-Khalil, uh, which has been completely taken over. I, I visited the Masjid al-Khalil, Ibrahim in Hebron in 1979. And there was a, a, a Jewish prayer room, maybe the size of one third of this stage, this, this section right here. I went back in 1989, there was a Muslim musalla about the size of this stage. And the rest had been taken over. But that building was built by the Mamluks. And then during the Seljuk times, during the Ottoman times, during the modern period, there's been a constant Muslim involvement with the site. But this involvement is being systematically written out of history. And as Muslims, we have to be aware of that and we have to resist it. The, the official position of Orthodox Judaism is that the temple that existed at the site where the masjid is now and the Qubbat al-Sakhra is now and the Muslim sacred uh, precincts, that this site where the first and, and second temple of Solomon existed was cannot, once the temple was destroyed, the second temple by Titus, the third temple can only be rebuilt after re, the re, the coming of the Messiah, and it will only be rebuilt, rebuilt by divine intervention. In other words, this is, will involve an act of God that has no worldly, temporal, secular, political sanctioning. So this is the official position 
of the overwhelming majority of Orthodox Jews and rabbis. There's a minority position that was articulated by Maimonides, Maimonides, Musa bin Maimun, the very famous rabbi of Andalusia and then traveled across North Africa during his life, that human intervention can result in the rebuilding of the temple. But this is a minority view that has been opposed by the secular state of Israel. So Israel historical, historically has been a secular state, a Jewish state in terms of Judaism interpreted as a nationalism and not a religious state. As many of most of the founders were atheists themselves. In any case, they've prevented efforts to rebuild the temple. They've always opposed, up until this time, groups such as the Temple Mount Faithful and other fanatical Jewish groups that have sought to lay a historical claim to rebuild the second temple or build the third temple, sometimes referred to as the Temple of Ezekiel, as the details related to the temple, its construction, its dimensions are mentioned in the Old Testament chapter of Ezekiel. Now, this position is of the state opposing the rebuilding of a temple is beginning to erode based on a number of factors. We'll mention, mention two here. First of all, the rise of a very virulent anti-Muslim bigotry and hatred amongst secular Jews. So you find increasingly secular Jews falling in line with the religious fanatical, the zealots, on many different positions and, uh, and positions and issues. And their, their falling in line has been propelled and urged by a rise in anti-Muslim hatred, such as this uh, type that we see here, usually called Islamophobia. So a rise of anti-Muslim hatred leads to a disregard of any Muslim positions motivated by that hatred and not motivated necessarily by any religious sentiments or religious justifications and positions. This hatred becomes blind hatred. And the hatred of Muslims leads to irrational political positions. This is very, very important. We see this here in the United States and we see it in the Muslim world. And here, the role played by groups like ISIS becomes critically important because their actions become primarily a, a, a primary factor in stoking that anti-Muslim hate just, and then translating that into irrational political positions. An example here, before the two journalists and culminating with the decapitation, beheading of Abdurrahman Kasik, something, all of these are totally unfounded and unsubstantiated in the Sharia. In any case, the support for any ongoing American war or ongoing American presence in the Middle East was 20%. After the first two beheadings of the, the journalist, uh, Foley and the, the second one, it rose to 70 support for American intervention and military involvement in the Middle East rose to 70%. So in less than a month, we went from 20% to 70%. And so a lot of that is irrational and irrational political position because we know the draining, uh, very negative consequences of the involvement in Iraq and Afghanistan for American politics domestically and globally. But despite that, 70% of Americans support returning to the Middle East. So this is rage, this is fear and security, uh, and a, a variety of factors that have absolutely nothing to do with realistic political positions. So you find this development occurring in Palestine also, where secular Jews who might have been very much opposed and the secular state opposed to rebuilding a temple, opposed to the destruction 
of Masjid Al-Aqsa and Qubba al Sakhra, as this anti-Muslim sentiment rises, an articulation of that is a rise in the support for the position of extreme right-wing, right very fanatical uh, religious Zionists. The second factor, so this is from the position of the American public, especially many more fundamentalist Christian groups, or sometimes referred to as Christian Zionists, whose numbers are not insignificant, and the Israeli public from the Muslim side, you find that the regimes that historically have been the backbone of Muslim state level resistance, particularly in the Arab world, to the Zionist political project, Syria, Jordan to a certain extent, the countries of the Gulf Co Cooperation Council, their hatred for the Muslim Brotherhood and their desire to see the Muslim Brotherhood destroyed translates or has serious political implications for Palestine. Because their argument, we want the destruction of the Muslim Brotherhood. Hamas is the Muslim Brotherhood in Palestine. Therefore, in our efforts to destroy the Muslim Brotherhood and to de destroy Hamas, we will support political Zionism in their war against Hamas, translating into their war against the Palestinian people. So from the Muslim side, you see, at least at the state level, a growing level of support for the extreme Zionist position. And this translates itself into ignoring the slaughter that took place in Gaza this summer. And in a sense, many of these regimes, and we forgot to mention Egypt, of course, and the regime of Sisi. Many of these regimes, even in a de facto sense, encouraging what happened this summer. Now, that has implications for Masjid al-Aqsa as the pressure is placed on the Israeli public and the Israeli government by the extreme right wing in Israel and here in the United States to actually rebuild the temple. These regimes silence indicates there won't be any major Arab state level resistance to that effort. What does that mean? That means that the people will have to be the resistance. Just as the people in Palestine and their supporters and solidarity movements throughout the world are the backbone of the resistance to the political Zionist project, the people, starting with the Muslim masses, will have to be the backbone of the resistance to protect Masjid al-Aqsa, to protect Qubba al sakhra and to prevent their destruction in the name of rebuilding or building the Temple of Solomon. So brothers and sisters, in conclusion, there are three things we recommend immediately for us to do, since we have to be the backbone of the opposition to this project. We cannot rely on any state, as most of you already realize. First of all, we have to pray to Allah and trust in Allah. If we don't trust in Allah, we might become so despondent and demoralized by the overwhelming and daunting obstacles in the path of preventing what systematically happened that we do nothing out of our depression and our, out of our demoralization. But if we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we'll say as Abdul Muttalib said when the Kaaba was on the verge of being destroyed by Abraha and his advancing forces. What did he say? Ana Rabbul Ibili. I I own these camels. Wilil Bayti Rabbun Yahmi. And the sacred precincts has a Lord that will protect it. So we have to believe that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect his house. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect this sacred sanctuary. 
and that we will do our part at a human level. We will not be demoralized, we will not be despondent, we will not be paralyzed in the face of the odds that appear to be against us because if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is with us, the Lord of this sacred precincts, no one can be against us. Secondly, we have to educate our fellow citizens to the significance of Jerusalem and, and perhaps more importantly, the religious plural, plural, pluralism, the religious pluralism of Jerusalem that Muslims have always respected and protected. Muslims have always respected the rights of Jews, Christians to worship in Jerusalem along with Muslims. And there's a long history documenting this, a history that's being distorted and denied. So we have to be the ones that educate people and we have to be the ones that keep the reality of this history alive. And uh, Dr. Hatem Bazian in his book on Jerusalem talks about this. I would highly recommend that for more details. Thirdly, we have to build networks of solidarity with other peoples and grassroots movement who are supportive of the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause throughout the world. And this is something AMP is doing very effectively, as you can see by the vast array of speakers who've been assembled for this conference. We have to realize we cannot do it alone. We cannot do it alone. It's going to take networks of international solidarity at, at the level of human means, SBAB. It's going to take networks of international solidarity to protect the sanctity of Jer Jerusalem, Masjid al-Aqsa, and Qubbat al-Sakhra. So these are three things that we have to support immediately. Other measures and steps, I'm sure that the subsequent speakers will touch on my time has expired. May Allah Ta'ala bless all of you. May Allah give us all courage, vision, and steadfastness in the light of seemingly undauntable uh, ads, but as we mentioned, and as we reiterate, as our great forefather Abdul Muttalib mentioned, and a Rabbul Ibli, Wulil Bayti Rabbun Yahmi. This house, this precinct, has a Lord which will protect it. Allah Ta'ala will do what He does. We have to do what He's enjoined on us to do. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. May Allah give us the opportunity to visit Masjid Al-Aqsa at least once in our lives. Ameen. And if we are unable to, then we donate money to keep its maintenance, inshaAllah. And that at least we gain some love for Masjid Al-Aqsa that is the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam as he loved it and as he led the Prophets, all of them in, co in congregation in Salah. SubhanAllah. The, the reminders that we have about what this place means to us is phenomenal. Our next speaker is Sister Sana Saeed. Sister Sana Sa Jamal Saeed has been an active member and volunteer of the Mosque Foundation for many years, particularly being an organizer for the Friday Night Live, which is an avenue to teach the youth and to bring them towards the masjid. Her current research and her current pursuits is um, studying the uh, health, health outcomes of underprivileged Arab American women and children, as well as the health outcomes project of women for, and children living in Palestinian refugee camps. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Sister Sana Saeed. So a couple of months ago now, I was uh, tasked with giving a seminar with AMP Chicago on the history of Palestine, of Fatih Palestine. And I picked up the story from the time of Muawiyah radiallahu an and took it all the way to Najm al-Din Ayyub, who um, uh, gained power many centuries later. So that's a couple, of cent uh, a couple of centuries of history. And everybody was excited about the portion where we reach Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, uh, rahimahullah, which is probably the most exciting portion to talk about when discussing Palestine's history. And there's this moment after the Battle of Hittin, when you feel like Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, rahimahullah, has set his sights on Jerusalem, 
that the, he has so much momentum uh, under his wings that he needs to just push towards the city. And it sounds like he's about to do it. But then he proceeds to go around and fight battles in every city, in countries all surrounding Palestine, but not in Palestine itself. So he fights battles in present-day Syria, in present-day Lebanon, and in present-day Jordan before he makes his push to Jerusalem. And the question becomes why? Why does Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi rahimahullah, after all this momentum uh, and after this immense victory, why does he not push straight to Jerusalem? And he's following the tradition of the men that, who he grew up under. He was a soldier in their armies, the generals that, that raised him, starting with Imad al-Din Zinki rahimahullah, who rose from northern Iraq and then made a push toward, against the crusaders towards Jerusalem himself. And he reaches Damascus. And at this time, Damascus is under a, a very corrupt control. Uh, there's famine, economic downturn, the people are uneducated, they've been oppressed for decades. And Imad al-Din Zinki wants to free Damascus from this, uh, from this control. And he hits up against the walls of Damascus over and over and over again, and he loses time and time again, because the people weren't ready to rise at that time. They had been so crippled by corruption. And the question becomes, why doesn't Imad al-Din Zinki just abandon Damascus and head towards Jerusalem? Al-Quds is still waiting. There's safe passage through a different route to head towards Al-Quds, but Imad al-Din doesn't do that. And his son after him, Nur al-Din, does the same thing. He goes across Bilad al-Sham, freeing city after city after city from the Crusaders, and doesn't head to Jerusalem. And you start, the question becomes overwhelming. Why is it that Al-Quds, although it's at the top of the agenda, is not the first move? And we, uh, the speakers that came before me discuss it to some portion. Jerusalem was, Al-Quds was never looked at as its own issue. It was never compartmentalized as its own cause. Al-Quds was the bigger picture of the Muslim world. It was included in the bigger picture of the Muslim world. So when we talk, when Imad al-Din Zinki talked about freeing the Muslim world from the Crusaders and freeing Al-Quds from the Crusaders, he started in Damascus. There was no road to Al-Quds for him that didn't go through Sham. For Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, the road to, the, uh, to Jerusalem first went through Cairo. And there was no way for him to enter it without first liberating Egypt from the Fatimid control. And there was no way to separate Jerusalem from any of these other issues. It rose when the cities around it rose, and it fell when the cities around it fell. And this follows the tradition of the Prophet وسلم, and the tradition that he ingrained in his Sahaba, that the Muslim Ummah is a living organism that is hurt and aches when part of it hurts and aches, and is only well when all of it is well. There is no success for only part of it. There has to be success in a package. And this might be a foreign idea to the political big shots, but it's not for the average Muslim. The average Muslim grieves when their Muslim brother or sister grieves. The average Muslim doesn't like the sight of uh, Muslim children becoming orphans or women widows or men widowers. This is something that hurts the average Muslim because deep inside of the average Muslim is the same ideology that Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi and Imad al-Din Zinki and Nur al-Din and the Sahaba before them sourced from their beloved Prophet sallallahu had. This ideology that there is no happiness or joy on our own, that we're an ummah that, that uh, succeeds and fails together. And we saw this in, uh, uh, in over the summer when there was the onslaught of violence in the Gaza Strip. And in the capitals of every Muslim country, people poured into the streets, ignoring their grief for some time to complain of, uh, of the grief of Gaza. Even in Syria, with all of its complaints that it could be having, they stopped for a portion of time to talk about Gaza, to talk about Gaza's widows, even though they have an overwhelming amount of their own. So deep inside of the average Muslim is this feeling in, in one of my favorite examples of this is after, uh, in Tunis, after they unseated Ben Ali, at around noon, you heard them saying their famous chant, which was Shab Yuri Disqat al Nadam. And they were saying this at noon, and it was overwhelming, and then about six hours later, you heard them suddenly saying what? Saying Shab Yuri Tahrir Palestine. It was instant. Their hearts were in sync. 
They knew what the next step was. No, po no political leader needed to tell them that, oh, Palestine is important for your success. They knew it in their hearts. This was something that they were raised on. They felt in the very fiber of their being. So suddenly they knew that although unseating Ben Ali was a success and one that had never happened before for them, that it wasn't a complete success without Al-Quds, that we had to turn our sights to Jerusalem. And it's hard for us to think this way sometimes on a political scale because we live right now in a society where the lingua franca is, is that your causes end where your border ends that you're not allowed to care about things that go on beyond your land. Actually, it's taboo to think about things that go on with your neighbor. You're supposed to only worry about your complaints. And even within the borders, we've been able to divide causes. Look at America, for example. Black America's problems is not Latino America's problems. Arab Muslims have different complaints than non-Arab Muslims. We've been able to find divisions in our causes even within borders. And still then, we find denominators. We're still able to say that women's issues are different than kids' issues, the poor different than the hungry. And our insistence on doing that is not part of our Islamic heritage. Our Islamic heritage overwhelmingly has been the story of talking about Islam as a whole, the concept of the ummah, this concept that's so invigorating and had been so invigorating for the Sahaba when they spread out of Medina like a bottle cap had been taken off of a bottle and they spread across the world. It was because their sites were on the world. There was no idea of just an Arab uh, Islamic state. No, it was the idea of Muslims everywhere and their causes being important. And sure, Al-Quds specifically is maybe the crown jewel to, that, to those causes, and the crown jewel may be the first to be robbed, but also, even if we set it back into its setting, the crown isn't complete without other cities. So when we are uh, tempted to talk about the Syrian issue like it's separate from Palestine, or tempted to talk about Masr like it has nothing to do with Palestine, know that that temptation has nothing to do with our heritage, with our story, our Islamic narrative. Our Islamic narrative has always been one of unity. And it's always been one of my brother's causes are my causes. And Al-Quds is one of the most important emblems of that. Al-Quds is one of the most important emblems of that. And we've seen, uh, and as um, Sheikh Omar said before me, that uh, Ibn Al-Qayyim's narration that Al-Quds's Al story is the story of Islam and not its story on its own. And we hope, inshallah, that we will see success in Al-Quds and that way see success across the Islamic world, bi'idhnillah. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum. Jazakumullah khairan. Jazakumullah khairan, Sister Sana. Something that just like clicked in my head, and I don't know if it's a coincidence or if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a way for making things clear. We started at the time of the Crusades with Imam al-Ghazali rahmatullahi alayhi when he wrote his book, his magnus opus, Ihya Ulum al-Din, the revival of the faith. And then comes, as Sister Sana said, Imad al-Din, who established the pillars. Then comes Nur al-Din, to show the light of the faith. And then comes Salah al-Din al-Ayyubi, who shows the justice and the righteousness of this Iman and of this faith that actually comes to liberate the Muslim Ummah. So that could be me just drawing a bunch of strings together like a conspiracy theorist. But Allahu A'lam, Wallahu Akbar, you know, I, I thought that was really cool. Without... Without further ado, we'd like to introduce our last and not least, but our final speaker, inshallah, for this segment, Sister Kristen Shremsky, who I remember when I worked with her was listed as one of the most dangerous journalists in the country by um, Campus Watch, or uh, Campus Watch by, you know, people, what's his name, David? Uh, Daniel Pipe, Pipes, and she said it was the biggest honor that she could have gotten to be recognized as one of the most dangerous journalists out there. Because of her research and because of her, you know, investigative journalism that exposes corrupt people who are trying to destroy the narrative of human rights, destroy the narrative of activists in Palestine, not only in Palestine, but elsewhere in the world. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our sister, Kristen Sremsky. As 
Assalamu alaikum. Um, thank you for that. I think the legend's growing way, way bigger than I actually really am. But um, it is true. It was after I actually, alhamdulillah, with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Um Ayman, who was sitting in the audience, roundly defeated the Israeli consul general to the Midwest in a debate. The next day, the ADL came out with an article naming me as among their top, I was a top third anti-Israel speaker in the country. So alhamdulillah for that. So, uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless my words, anything that I say that's correct comes from Allah, any mistakes I make are my own. So, I know we're pressed for time. So, I'm boiling my, point, my uh, speech down into, I'm going to give you my three main points because I need to make them get out there, and then, inshallah, whatever I can pad it with, I will in the, in the time allotted. So... This is hard when, I, when you have to wear reading glasses because I need to see you also. So first of all, the U.S. law dictates that a country that receives U.S. foreign aid must protect religious freedom. It's an American law. We hear a lot about Israel violating international law. They are violating American law when they block Muslims from praying in Al-Aqsa. When they block Palestinian Christians from going into Jerusalem, they are breaking American law. Second, Imam Zaid Shakur talked about this. That initially, uh, there was no interest in Israeli society for the Third Temple. Israel is a secular society. Zionism was a secular uh, ideology based. A lot of it came up out of the labor movement. But what's happened is that the powers that be know that Zionism is dead, the project has failed, Israel has no political future, and so therefore they have to take their racist apartheid policies and wrap them up in this messianic uh, legend built around creating the third temple in order to continue to ensure that the apartheid state of Israel is going to go forward. And finally, and this is the most important, I'm gonna focus most of my talks on this, when our Muslim leaders cooperate with Zionist organizations, when they continue to go on funded trips to Israel paid for by the Israeli government, when they engage in illegitimate interfaith cooperation, I'm not talking interfaith dialogue that helps us to understand each other, I'm talking about illegitimate interfaith cooperation with a normalizing agenda, they are responsible for the threats that are happening to Al-Aqsa right now. In 1967, immediately after the end of the Six-Day War when Israel occupied what was left of Jerusalem, General Shlomo Gorin tried to convince a commanding officer to blow up Dome of the Rock once and for all. In 1982, there was actually an attempt to blow up the Dome of the Rock. And the reason why we hear a lot about Aqsa, we know that the entire sanctuary is a mosque. But the, the Zionists or, or the uh, people who are building, calling for the Third Temple, believe that it should be built near the site of where the Dome of the Rock stays. So that's why there's a lot of talk about uh, blowing up the Dome of the Rock. In 1982, there was a man named Yehuda Etzion of the, a group called the Jewish Underground. He had plans to blow up Dome of the Rock and he got caught and he was put in prison. Israeli society was not prepared at that point to go that route. They liked the status quo because it kept a sort of peace with Jordan and with the Palestinians. And again, as we said, the, the Israeli uh, government was not at all interested in the, in the Third Temple issue. But what happened, this was a turning point for the temple movements, and, and all the information that I have right now is coming from research that I'm doing on the rise of the temple movements, and in addition, looking at laws that exist within the Jerusalem municipality, as well as within the Knesset. And initially, I thought I was going to write a big article, but I'm it looks like it's probably going to turn out to be a book. So since we're pressed for time, you're going to have to wait for a year or so and, and read the book, and inshallah you'll be able to, to see everything that I wanted to say. Um, anyway, what he learned from that lesson in his time in prison was that the society wasn't ready, so they needed to educate. And they spent the next 40 years educating Israeli society on the need to build this third temple. They were able to, the, the Orthodox Rabbinical Council forbade Jews from going onto Al-Aqsa. Um, 
for a variety of their religious reasons. They have been successful in changing some of the Jewish law to permit now Jews to go up there, and we're seeing that. And the difference, you know, we've had attacks on Al-Aqsa since 1967. The difference is that the Temple Movements, this collection of about 19 organizations, is gotten much stronger, they're more organized, the Israeli society is, is open to the idea, and they're being very much funded and supported by different agencies within the Israeli government, such as the Department of Education, that not only is funding them, but is actually including all of their work works in their uh, educational curriculums for school children. And when they have a reading list that they give educators to use, the Temple Movement's reading list is in there. In addition, within the Israeli occupation forces itself, it used to be that soldiers only were governed by Israeli military law. There is now a rabbinical council within the Israeli military which states that the Palestinians are descendants from the biblical Amalekites and in the Bible you can find these passages in the Old Testament it says that these Amalekites must be eradicated, meaning killed. And the soldiers, the IOF, follows this rabbinical uh, dictate coming through them, and that's why we're seeing uh, an increase. They're, they're measuring that there is definitely an increase in IOF violence against Palestinians over the last couple of years, and we're seeing a lot more death because of it. The Oslo Accords also helped the temple movements because Israel, Israelis became frightened. They were so frightened that they had people sitting down negotiating with the Palestinians that they were ready to start embracing the temple movements as a way to try to stop that process. I, I interviewed a professor, um, his name is Yuri Davis, who now lives in the West Bank. Actually, I think he has converted to Islam. He's renounced not only his Judaism, but he I think he calls himself a, a Hebrew now. He, he won't even call himself a Jew. And of course, now he's Muslim, although I believe that he's secular. But he has said that civil society and the political domain are more and more aware that Zionism is a hopeless cause and that Israel has no political future. As a result, we're, that's why we're seeing more and more stink sanctions, attacks on Al-Aqsa, Al and why they're supporting the temple movements. So, but I want to, what I really want to focus on in the remaining time is the three things, two things. One, I talked about American law because we have a petition, the American Muslims for Palestine started a petition and we partnered with Jewish Voice for Peace and uh, Friends of CBL North America, which is a Christian organization. And together we have, uh, we've started a nationwide petition asking Secretary of State John Kerry to hold Israel accountable and hold Israel to the same standards we hold other countries that abuse uh, the freedom of religion. And each year the State Department issues a report on international religious freedom, and each year they document abuses going on in Israel against Palestinian Muslims, Palestinian Christians, and Jews who are not orthodox enough, or the wrong kind of Jew, and against African immigrants. And, and we see this over and over again, and the fact that they are still allowed to do it, they still get their $3 billion a year, is outrageous. And it's something that we here in America can try to have an impact with. And in addition, in December, when legislators are in their home uh, districts, uh, we are going to be starting a legislative effort. Uh, JVP is putting the pieces uh, together for this, but AMP and Sabil will be, will be working with it as well, where we're going to start trying to build those relationships with our legislators to get them to, they're even actually going to be contacting a few specific ones to see if they'll actually issue a letter saying we must hold Israel to the same standards and this is not acceptable and Palestinians have the right to visit their places of worship. But the other thing that I want to talk about is support in the country. Uh, we talked about Christian Zionists up here. We do have a lot of Christian Zionism support, but there are a lot of uh, Zionist and pro-Israel organizations that send money to Israel and to organizations that support Israel. And American law has changed so that when these organizations give a grant to an organization within Israel, they no longer have to say who's receiving the money and what it's being used for. And the Jewish Daily Forward, which is an excellent newspaper, and I highly recommend that people read it because you're going to get more truth in that paper that you, than you get in American media, um, did a major study of Jewish organizations and found out that 
they, they didn't look at religious organizations because they don't have to file uh, their tax information because they're tax exempt. But they looked at other organizations and together they have a net, net worth, net assets of $26 billion a year. The largest portion of their expenditures go towards organizations that support the state of Israel. $4 billion go into grants to organizations in Israel. And we, we have no way of knowing, but we're pretty sure that some of that is going to support settlements and support the settler movement, which is behind the Temple Mount movement. So let's talk, though, about our, our people. Let's talk about our community. I'm going to give you an example, and I only have five minutes left, so I'm going to rush through this. We have organizations constantly who are working with Zionist organizations. ISNA is a big one. They just came out with a report on Jewish-Muslim guide, dialogue guidelines, and they worked with the Jewish United Fund, terribly Zionist organization, Foundation for Ethnic Understanding, terribly Zionist-leaning organization, and others. And this is it looks like a great report because it talks about how Jews and Muslims can get along. The problem is there is no religious tension between Jews and Muslims. It's a political tension that goes right down to the occupation. So when we start with the premise that we need to have these dialogue guidelines in order so Jews and Muslims can get along, that is starting from a Zionist narrative that wants people to believe that Jews and Muslims can't get along. But here's an example from just in Chicago. We used to have a rabbi in Chicago named Asher Lopatin. He, he's since moved to New York. He's an Orthodox rabbi. He had a um, his synagogue was up on the North Shore in Chicago, and for several years he participated in an event called Iftar in a Synagogue, and many of our Muslim organizations endorsed it, supported it, got their followers or their, their community members to go. Never check this guy out. He has a blog. I got all this information off his blog. He follows not just Zionism, but the Jabotinsky form of Zionism, which is so violent that David Ben-Gurion, the first Prime Minister of Israel, rejected it as being too violent. He follows that. He, he, he was funding the creation of a settlement in the Negev. Right now we have tens of thousands of Bedouins in the Negev desert, the Nakab, who have been displaced and put into these urban centers and they've, in order for the development to happen. And he was funding that and his plan was to go and be the mayor once it happened, but um, his daughter became quite ill and he had to give up those plans according to his blog. But this is what I need to tell you about and then I'll end on this. He wrote, I have to read you a little bit. He took, he took some Muslim imams to Israel. And when they came back, they're in Washington, D.C. because they were going to have a debriefing at the State Department. And he wrote a blog about a conversation they had about Al-Aqsa. And this gets right to the crux of why interfaith cooperation with the Zionist agenda is so dangerous to us as a community. He says, they had a talk. And he posed the question whether was the Dome of the Rock really a mosque? One of the imams, there were two imams, one of them there said the entire sanctuary is a mosque, which was really hard for this rabbi to, to accept. He goes, but luckily, One of the other imams, older and more experienced in interfaith work, more experienced in interfaith work, and I'm talking about illegitimate interfaith cooperation, said that this model of sharing a mosque in a synagogue was slowly and quietly being developed in America. One day, he said, it could be exported, and that was a model that perhaps could be used on the Temple Mount. This was in his thing. This was in his blog post. So we have an imam saying we're already working on that. He saw no problem with splitting the area that has been there since time immemorial and saying, yeah, maybe we can, we can send it to, export it to Jerusalem and we can do it there. And then once that conversation happened, once the rabbi got an imam to say, yeah, we can build a synagogue next to Dome of the Rock, no problem. He goes, then we would have to pose the question and ask our Jewish brothers and sisters to agree, to, to ponder the question, did the Dome of the Rock actually have a legitimate right to exist? 
When we engage in illegitimate interfaith cooperation and we keep silent on the truth about Palestine and we don't speak truth to power and we don't call for Israel to be held accountable because we want to look like we're getting along, this is the result. This is the result. And I'm going to urge you all later on today, I have an issue on this particular subject. It's called creeping normalcy because I'm, I'm, I have to conclude. So um, we'll talk more about that there. The thing is there, is, there is a lot that we can do. We don't have to just sit here and wring our hands and talk about how horrible the situation is. Please sign the petition. With Jewish Voice for Peace and Sabil together with AMP, we're hoping to get hundreds of thousands of signatures to send to John Kerry, and it does make an impact. You know, I called the State Department the other day. They called me back. We called him on Kader Adnan when he was hunger striking. We had this national huge call in. They talked to us and said, you know, we're aware of the situation. We're talking to Israel. In the very next day, they reached an agreement so Kader could end his hunger strike and be re finally get out of administrative detention. Our activism does work. Even something as small as a signature on the petition. Look up the Stop the JNF Fund. Start looking at different ways that we can try to get the tax exempt status taken away from some of these Zionist organizations. That's what I'm talking about. I'm here to talk to you about this issue, not because I want us to go away saying, oh, things are terrible, what are we going to do? But that we all as Muslims, this is a Muslim issue. The very first time I ever heard the Adan, outside of a, you know, a handheld device. I heard it coming through the airwaves was in Jerusalem. The very first time I pressed my face into the warm soil of Palestine and made sujood, I knew that I had come home. This is a Muslim issue. It is not just a Palestinian issue. It is our responsibility. And on the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to ask us, what did you do for my sacred mosque and the surroundings which I have blessed? Please take action. Please sign the petition and sign up for AMP's email alert so that you can continue to help us work on this cause and make positive change using American laws. We're in a unique position to make change, and with your help, we can do it. And with Allah's help, we can do it, inshallah. Thank you very much. Jazakumullahu <laughs> khairan. But also as a reminder, it's not only a Muslim issue, it is also a Jewish issue and a Christian issue for our brothers who are also suffering. Dr. Hatem Bezian one time mentioned that he has Jews in the southern of Nablus that are actually restricted from having rights because they are pro-Palestinian and because they have that narrative that they know that this is not an Israeli state, it is a Palestinian land. And just like in Jerusalem where they are literally being stripped of their rights, probably more than anybody and no one really talks about it. Our Christian brothers and sisters and our Jewish and brother, brothers and sisters need to have representation and they need to be part of our dialogue as one insha'Allah. And of course, Imam Zaid always reminds me that none of this can come to fruition without dua. It cannot come to fruition without our supplication. Just like Brother Amr Muzaffar posted on Facebook and of course social media is a powerful tool. He says, when these things happen, when these calamities happen around the world, the first thing that should happen is sujood, prostration. You say, Hasbunallah wa ni'm al wakil. You know, God is an excellent guardian. He is sufficient for us. And then we commit our actions and we do what needs to be done that our scholars and our activists and our community leaders have put forth for us. And then inshallah, it will be a fatah. And this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, inna fatahna laka fatahan mubina, inshallah. That will be our reality and that will be our conclusion for tonight or for this morning, sorry. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.